you know, could we all use a little bit of self-care or a lot of self-care? Um, but in the time of the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, an insane pandemic with a lackluster leadership for lack of a better word, and I'm being kind, um, calling for people to speak up and then shaming them for when they do speak up. <laughs> We are all living online right now and we're obsessed with breaking news. We're obsessed with viral videos. I mean, I know that for myself, I'm overstimulated. So in other words, your book couldn't have come at a better time. Um, I was so giddy at the satirical lens in which you wrote about the self-care and the lifestyle space. And I totally got wrapped up in the ritual, in the ritual space, which is a phenomenal name, by the way. Um, and the stereotypes that Marin, Devin, Khadija, Evan, and others played Highlighting these communities and the inner world of the women's lifestyle space provided a much needed laugh. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You just wrote a funny, unapologetic story of the tragic and sometimes necessary era of social media. And I, for one, have a love-hate with it myself. I am grateful for the way it can connect us all, inspire us, and make things a little easier. But as you point out in your book, it also seems to give us permission to use a megaphone to tear each other down, call each other out, backstab, have zero fact checking, and take little responsibility and give no fucks. It certainly <laughs> made me do a self-reflection on the toxicity of who I follow, why I follow, what I promote, and why. And I love that you highlight the transactional experience of the self-care industry and how that le leaves many feeling inadequate. And what I really loved is the way you called out our obsession with health and wellness, and yet our own inability to trust our gut on what we actually need. We really need to look to ourselves and our own innate natural instincts rather than jumping on a bandwagon just because it's glossy and it's deemed cool. And that we don't have to rely on buzzy words, but we can really trust our own intuition and to feel whole and to feel worthy. So I'm so grateful for this book because it was very needed. It was the perfect prescription for where we're at right now. Um, and if you don't mind, I would love, if you want to read a passage, I would love to have you read a bit. This is describing Ritual and the two co-founders, Devin and Marin. This is from Marin's point of view. Ritual asked, when's the last time you put yourself first? Our app pressed a pause button on all the bullshit in daily life. You could track your meditation minutes and ounces of water consumed and REM sleep and macros and upcoming mercury retrogrades and see who among your friends was best at prioritizing hashtag me time based on how many hours a day they spent on the app. It was a virtual space where at Smoky Mountain Heart Opener posted videos of herself doing forearm stands in a thong leotard and at Pussy Graps Back shared photos of her feet soaking in Epsom salt after a march. It was the digital sanctuary where you went to unload your pain. We earned revenue from the brands who offered solutions to that pain. Serums and creams, juices and dusts, clays and scrubs, drugs and masks, oils and enemas, scraping and purging, vaping and waxing, lifting and lengthening, straightening and defining, detox and retox the cycle of life. Devon was the face of ritual. She was also the body. She was literally the after photo in a piece of branded content promoting a 30-day cleanse. T-shirt slogans popped on her flat chest. Her collarbone was usually exposed and opalescent. She was small enough that she appeared appropriately human-sized in photographs taken at red carpet launches, while I stood to one side like her Zaftig cousin visiting from another country, the country of Wisconsin. Devin hid the work it took to make that body. I wore my work like a second visible skin. Over the course of 18 months, I'd gone from a size eight to a 14 and upped my Zoloft prescription twice. My thighs rubbed together when I walked in a dress. The internet told me this was normal. The internet showed me ads for non-toxic anti-chafing gel. No one ever called us by the other's name. Well, yeah. tell me about that. I want to hear, so what was the impetus? Did you have personal experiences in this space or were you watching and following along? Like what started this? So I've been a part of online communities since I was 13 years old. I'm 35 now, but I've been on the internet since the nineties and it's where I, I, you know, I was kind of a alienated nerdy bookworm kid that didn't feel like I had a lot of friends at school and the internet provided me with friends. And so I've been online for a long time. Um, in 2014, I was a member of this Facebook group. So someone else started a Facebook group for women writers. It was a private secret, just add a friend. 
she thought 20 people would join within three months there were 30,000. Oh my gosh. And I was one of them. And the energy in this Facebook group was like electrifying. I loved it. I spent all my time in this group. And I said like, why don't we put on a show in the barn? Like, let's have a conference. So in three months, I organized our first conference. We raised $50,000 on Kickstarter. We rented out Cooper Union in New York City. Um, I loved it. And this eventually became a 501c3 nonprofit. I had a co-founder. Um, we were doing New York conferences about uh, book publishing and media. And we started doing LA conferences about TV and film because the gender, as I'm sure you know, the gender disparity for women is even worse in Hollywood than in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved the conferences, but the Facebook group was so filled with drama that it was consuming my life. It was my like seven day a week job. As soon as I woke up in the morning and the last thing I did before I went to sleep was check who was fighting with whom, who needed me to step in and mediate some kind of conflict. Um, it was drama, drama, drama. And I just couldn't do it anymore. So I completely burned out on the drama, even though the conferences filled me with joy and I felt really proud of them. And the conferences were not no drama. When you were at the conference, they were like, truly diverse, inspiring. I mean, we had amazing keynote speakers. We had Lisa Kudrow, Gina prince Bythewood, Claudia Rankin. We had, it was so wonderful. And the toxicity of the online community just destroyed my mental health. I left Facebook forever. And I told my partner, I don't think I'll ever be able to write again. And he was like, you will, you will. And I was like, don't tell me what to do. But he was right. <laughs> um, once I rested, I did start writing again. And so I started writing this book. So I, I definitely came from a place of Marin that I was burnt out on. I, I was just amazed that women could attack other women in the name of being feminists. They right. were often fights about social justice. So one person would say something clueless. And instead of saying, actually, you know, you need to educate yourself about this, it would just be like, destroy her, call her workplace, tattle on her to her boss. It was so toxic. And so that's the, the little seed that became self-care and that became Marin. And then with the character of Marin, so I am making fun of the wellness space and I am looking at the hypocrisies of that space, but I'm also looking at the hypocrisies of these kind of internet activists that are so certain that they're right and they're righteous that they will actually hurt other people in the name of their feminism. And I think that's what Marin does by the end of the book. She thinks she's doing the right thing for Devin, but of course she's harming Devin. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can see that. Um, and I feel like that's played out as well. I mean, in the media with the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter, um, just destroying other people, at, you know, like you don't, you don't belong in the Me Too movement or you shouldn't say this. And um, that so no social media becomes a kind of like court, like this has become yeah. a court system where the mob decides what exactly. punishment should be meted out. We've, we've lost the ability to have a conversation, I feel like, and it's, everyone has to make their point known and, and we've, we've lost that discourse that's so important with our community. I mean, that's, and I, I wonder if that's maybe, and this is another rant, but why things are so divided, you know, like we shouldn't be, we, I personally feel like we shouldn't be in categories of we're left and we're right. Like we should, in an ideal world, be able to sort of have blended views of X, Y, and Z and not hate on each other. Like, it's just crazy to me. And I, I wonder if the birth of the internet lately is, and now we're all at home and we're pent up and stuff, is allowing that sort of behavior and, you know, and the, the inability to be seen, you know, because you, you're sort of faceless when you're online. So you can sort of say whatever you want without any responsibility. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea, like, in your mind of where she's going to go or what? what's next? Where Marin will go next? Yeah. It's so funny. Um, it's like some people finish the book and send me their ideas. Like one person was like, oh, is she going to go like go to a spot? Like, is she going to turn into Devin? Like, is she going to turn her health around and then make a comeback? And she's like healthier and like hotter than Devin. <laughs> um, I'm back. <laughs> there's also this, uh, while I was writing the book, I, I went through like a breakup with my own co-founder and the nonprofit that I ran that was like really painful. It's like a divorce. Cause you're like, it's your best friend. It's your wife. It's your, it's your business partner. It's like all these roles combined. Um, and so I didn't realize that this happens all the time that co-founders frequently um, break up. And I listened to, while I was writing the book, I listened to season two of the startup podcast, which is about this matchmaking app called dating ring that I don't think exists anymore, but it's two women that started it. And filled with emotion and conflict. Um, and at some point they go to the CEO whisperer, Jerry Colonna, who's like the super nice guy that 
he's like a therapist for co-founders. He's not actually a licensed therapist, but like this is his coaching role. And they recorded like the session that these two women did with this guy, listening to them and getting them to see the other sides. It was like listening to someone, it was like listening to Esther Perel. It was like listening to couples counseling, but between co-founders. Oh, interesting. And so I've also thought about that, like would Marin and Devin go to one of these coaches? Like would they work on their relationship with like a, yeah. a couples counselor? That's so interesting. I know. I, she's, she was, I mean, she was certainly for me the most relatable in a way because she had that, that purpose. Like she really wanted, in my mind, wanted to do what was good, essentially, you know? Um, and I guess at the end of it, I want I just so want her to feel good in her body, you know, and not apologize for yeah whatever. Yeah, it's interesting too because you know I had this piece go viral this summer, an essay I wrote about the girl boss and the kind of the end of the girl I boss know, and the downfall. But um, some some people bristled at it. So, some women, there's like a whole in section of Instagram where women are defending themselves against me, and they're like proud girl bosses. Yeah, but right. I think like there's like a misunderstanding that I'm like somehow against female ambition or something. But that's not what I'm saying. Like I'm ambitious, you're ambitious. Like I'm not against women being ambitious. I'm against this kind of hollow, fake branding that's like hiding worse things behind the scene. That's really what I'm skeptical of. Well, yeah, I, that didn't come across for me. What came across for me is putting your money where your mouth is. Yeah, totally. I think you said that really well. I felt really inspired by, your, by that. And it was eye-opening for me because a couple of the people that are named and I, I've watched and seen, you know, like it was, um, I really loved it. I, I was very inspired by it. And it is, it's inspiring for me because I am ambitious and I want to grow and listening to words like that and the peers and how other people view it is important because I want to grow and scale. And I thought it was really inspiring. So kudos to you because it was really, it was, it was, I was woke. <laughs> It was great. I feel like your book was sort of Pandora's box for me in that way of was angering and you know like oh my god um, and that self reflection and deep digging and um, it was great and so in a way it was my own form of self care and like healing myself like what is it that I want to be and do and what do I want to put out there and follow and um, it was a great like like. Um, like healing, like just taking my skin off, you know, it was like this healing process um, and in a form of self-care. And for you, like, what are ways in which you perform self-care? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because I, this ties back to something you said earlier at the very beginning is that um, I started seeing a new therapist like last year, maybe. And she didn't know that I was a writer. I hadn't told her about the book or whatever. And at our first session at the end, she's like, okay, so I think what we're going to work on with you is self-care. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I just wrote a book called self-care and it's all about how it's all bullshit. <laughs> but what she taught me really is, is to check in with my own body. I never check in with my own body. I'm always in my head all the time. I'm always thinking, I'm always scrolling, I'm always reading, I'm always looking, I'm talking. I hardly ever say like, how do I actually feel? Yeah. Like, how does my body feel? Like, so this has been revolutionary. The therapy has? To just think, ask myself, how do I feel? <laughs> Thinking like, what do I really need right now? Do I really need a glass of wine or what I need is a walk outside? Have I been outside today? You know, like, yeah. so it's, it's really basic. I think self-care is free and it's basic. It's drink water, sleep, um, go outside. Yeah. Um, but you can't market that stuff. So other That's stuff. Trying to figure that out because yeah. you just totally hit the nail on the head. I mean, and I think that's a silver lining about the pandemic is that we've had to simplify a lot. And those are those like innate carnal, like we need to be fed. We probably need to be touched. Yeah. Um, we need sleep. You know, it's pretty simple stuff, but we don't do that anymore. And, um, it's weird that we don't realize that that's even an option to like, that's part of substance that we really, that we, it's substance that we have to have and need to, to survive. It's weird that we don't check, check in with ourselves enough. Really also a really wonderful piece that I really enjoyed and loved and also made me do like a, wow, you know, do I need this or do I want this glass of wine at night? I really loved I loved that bit of self-care for you. Can you tell me anything about that? Yeah, I was nervous about writing about it. So um, I, I decided to, did I freeze or am I okay? 
You you did, but you're back to it. Could be my computer or my internet. So Charlie I don't know. will fix it later. Yeah. Um, so I I struggled with drinking. I was never a binge drinker, but I thought like I have to go to AA or I just have to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. Those were like the two ideas I had. And um, then I heard about this writer Annie Grace who had this like 30 day experiment of no drinking, and I finally thought like 30 days, like I think I could do. 30 days. Yep. And so I read her book and I ended up doing 104 days. And so this happened during the pandemic. I actually stopped drinking wine there during the pandemic. As I watched on social media, everyone I know, like making the biggest martinis yeah. I've ever seen and joking, you know, it's 9am. Can we start? You know, there's a lot of joking about heavily drinking. So that was kind of a surreal experience to not drink at that time. Mm -hmm. But I was nervous about writing about it because I know a lot of people do commit to a sober lifestyle and I didn't want to seem, I didn't want to seem like I was failing at that or that I was criticizing their choice. And then I finally thought like, if I write this and it helps one other person like stop drinking for 30 days, I think that's a win because maybe there are other women out there like I am who aren't binge drinkers, but are maybe noticing they have this nightly habit and they aren't comfortable with the habit. So I think it's a real like personal exploration. Um, and yeah, so I, I tried to offer that up. I thought you did a great job and it was really, um, I, I feel like we all are probably drinking too much to my unders from what we, from what I'm observing, from what I'm hearing. Um, I know that I, for one, I haven't been drinking every night, but I probably drink more than I should. And it's more like- than the, you were. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you look back and you're like compared to then, compared to now. Then, how do we go back to normal? Does it suddenly go back to normal? Am I, am I not going to look forward to that glass of wine after whatever? And I, I think it's great. And I think the honesty, and it's certainly, it was, you know, the night that I read it was a, a little bit ago and it was funny. I was about to open a glass, have a glass of wine. And I was like, I don't, I shouldn't, I don't need to do that. And it, you know, I had a moment of like, what do I need? And I actually made myself some tea and I was like, this is perfect. It appears that not engaging in self-care is the new mom woman shaming. Though all the women in the book judged others for not taking care of themselves in the way others thought was correct, none of the women seem to know how to take care of themselves. Why is it so hard for women to practice self-care? Yeah, so I, I imagine my three main characters on a spectrum. So Devin is so obsessed with wellness that it becomes unhealthy. So I would say she has orthorexia. She's obsessed with healthy food. She overexercises. Every time she exercises, she pushes herself to the limit. Um, Marin is on the opposite spectrum where Marin's like, this whole thing is bullshit. Like, I'm going to drink as much as I want. You know, I'm going to, you know, it's so it's fine if I gain weight because I'm, you know, I'm a feminist. But really, yeah. she's not health. She's not healthy. Yeah. Um, but I think Khadija's in the middle. Khadija's a vegan. Um, she's now taking care of her body for two. Um, I, I think of her as more the, the middle realistic um, route. So I was trying to kind of show the, the extremes. But I think, I think the questioner is right that I think we do spend a lot of time judging. And I think Instagram enables us, right? That we can look at other people but like intimate things that maybe we'd never know. Like maybe I would never know what my best friend washes her face with. But now I'm like, oh, you have a 10 step routine. I don't have a 10 step routine. Do I need a 10 step routine? I know it's true on a site like, so Teresa is asking on a site like Instagram, if you follow a celebrity or actor and actress that we like or admire for whatever reason, if they're suddenly promoting diet, bikinis, et cetera, uh, will you then by the algorithm, wait, I'm sorry, will you by the algorithms by similar types of accounts, how do you stop that affecting your mental well-being and feeling of worth by seeing the wonderful lives they are living? Realistically, we know it's not real, but it's like an earworm. It's there. Mm. That's a good question. It's, it's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I've become more conscious of for self-care is like I click on the app and then I ask myself like, okay, now I did it. Do I feel better or worse than before I clicked? If I feel worse than before I clicked, um, that's telling me something about my, my use of social media and about, about who I'm following. Um, I, I, it's interesting because I was more of a Twitter person because I'm very verbal. I'm yeah. not really an image person. Love Twitter. Um, so I was much more on Twitter. But this summer, like 
people on Instagram have responded so much to my novel that Instagram has become my like safe place and my space of joy. <laughs> so Instagram now makes me feel good more than it makes me feel bad. And I, I deactivated my Twitter account a couple weeks ago because I noticed every time I was on there, I felt worse. Um, what's the reason that you left the book so open-ended? <laughs> so when I wrote this, my fantasy was that women would read it in book clubs and argue about the ending. That's what I wanted people to talk about it. So I didn't leave it with a clear, I don't tell you what to think at the end of the book. And I think for some readers, this is upsetting to them. And I've seen some Goodreads reviews that are like one star, like I didn't know what to think at the end. And I'm like, use your Not brain. <laughs> yeah. um, when I was writing it, I had a few friends read it. And like one friend was like, um, thought it was good that that someone finally saw that Devin was a victim. And I had other readers say, um, Marin is the abuser. She manipulated Devin. I mean, she manipulated the whole thing at the end. So this argument about whether Devin is a victim and the ambiguity about it and letting Devin, this is a question I wanted to ask with the book. Who gets to decide whether someone is a victim? Does the culture get to decide? Does the person get to decide? Do we think that Devin's a victim? I think this is, I tried to leave it open-ended enough that someone could argue either, you could argue a okay, case either way. You could say, absolutely, she just doesn't realize it yet. Or you could say, she's not Evan's victim. There have been, it seems like there are other victims of Evan's, but Devin chose this. I think you could argue that too. No, so I'm trying to get at, at the more gray area of Me Too. I think there are ex egregious examples of assault and harassment like Harvey Weinstein. Obviously he's a predator. But how many Harvey Weinsteins are there? There are a lot of other gray area situations where maybe a woman consented to something and regretted it later. Maybe it was unclear whether she consented. Um, so I wanted Devin's relationship with Evan to be complicated enough to discuss and whether Marin did the right thing or not at the end. Well, I, have, I know that I've missed conversations like this. And I think that's what's been so great with starting this book club is being able to talk to writers and thinkers like yourself and having like a really great conversation. I know for me, it's like brain food. It feels so bad. And I love, love sharing this. And it, the responses have been so great. I know that my, the audience has been so excited for this book and the response has been so wonderful. So I'm, I'm so happy. Thank you to everyone who came today. Thank you. Yeah. And who's watching, who's going to watch this in the future. And thank you, Lee. Thank you so much. I know this you're taking up your time and just, I, I'm so appreciative of your time and, and having this conversation. It's a pleasure. And I think it's, I think it's brave of you to do this about this book, honestly. I think, <laughs> I think it is. Thank I think you. It's brave. So thank you. Thank you for doing, picking my book. Well, thank you for making me look in the mirror. So <laughs> Thanks, Jen. All right. Bye. Bye, Lee.